Hello, future enthusiasts. I'm your host, Thor. Our modern reality is far removed from the worlds we typically see in the imaginations of futurists of old. Yet, the technologies we speculated on mere decades ago in thought experiments and classified studies are now entering the psyche of applied science and space exploration. Today we're discussing how one of the most likely propulsion systems humans will use to achieve interstellar travel in the near future can be leveraged for space exploration of our solar system. In the 1920s, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who derived the rocket equation and is considered the father of space exploration, envisioned a spacecraft carrying a massive sail which used the momentum of a parallel beam of shortwave electromagnetic rays to accelerate into deep space. About 50 years later, researchers at Lockheed would propose the Halley Comet Rendezvous mission. This was the first time a solar sail would be proposed on a real-world vehicle. Halley's Comet has a retrograde orbit, meaning probes launched from Earth in prograde orbits will have very brief encounters with the comet. This is not ideal for study, and solar sails were considered a solution to this problem since the probe could use its solar sail over longer periods to collect enough velocity to achieve longer intercepts. We can see from this proposal where solar sails are best applied. Situations where small vehicles need to perform maneuvers normally requiring expenditures of lots of fuel mass over long periods of time. Eventually, this concept was declined, and Earth's gravity would be used instead for a gravitational slingshot, an approach used in the 1985-1986 Halley's Comet Rendezvous mission undertaken by Japan, part of the Halley Armada missions. The later success of four solar sail missions, Light Sail A and B, NEA Scout, and ATP 2014, demonstrated how this propulsion can be used to explore near-Earth objects at low cost. The logical evolution of the solar sail concept expands to include an array of laser beams, which increases accessible thrust. And this is also where laser propulsion starts. It has recently attracted the interests of science and the commercial and public spaceflight worlds. Arthur Kantrowitz proposed using a laser to ablate a thin layer of inert fuel on the rear of a lightweight spacecraft. Kantrowitz was inspired by discussions at Livermore Laboratory, realizing that the gigawatt free electron lasers developed by the DoD for the Strategic Defense Initiative or Star Wars project could be leveraged for a surface launch system. The Falcon experiment showed that a nuclear reactor could pump a 10 megawatt xenon laser, which could put a 14 kilogram payload into orbit. This concept relied on pulsed lasers, since ablated fuel needs an opportunity to expand between pulses. And beam efficiency was limited to between 2 and 5 percent, so pulsed lasers are more ideal at these low efficiencies. According to a NASA study, 10% efficiency could be achieved at most using these novel nuclear pumps lasers. However, the game has changed since the times of SDI and Falcon. We no longer need to rely on nuclear pumped lasers to accomplish these goals. The most important realization around laser propulsion is understanding that it represents a vertical leap from chemical binding energies to electromagnetic energies. All spacecraft that we build today use the energy of chemical bonds to derive thrust, and therefore tend to be very slow. A chemical rocket capable of reaching, say, 20% of the speed of light would be impossibly large. Yet, humans are capable of accelerating objects to these relativistic speeds in the laboratory with relative ease. Laser propulsion allows us to harness electromagnetic energies at the macro scale and propel spacecraft to fractions of light speed. Recent technological advances in photonics have yielded inexpensive fiber optic amplifiers which increase the efficiency of lasers, and this innovation specifically has delivered lasers powerful enough to be useful in a laser propulsion system. This allows us to build lasers which 40 years ago would necessarily be powered by a nuclear reactor. There is a clear opportunity to place these laser arrays either in orbit or on the Earth's surface, and this has not gone unnoticed. There is increasing pressure for further research into these ideas. 
By shifting focus from interstellar to local missions, the short-term viability of laser propulsion fully comes into view. Lasers are invaluable for pushing mass to Mars, the Moon, the gas giants, as well as boosting payloads into orbit from the Earth's surface. Parkin Research, founded in 2014, uses a slight variation of the laser propulsion system, utilizing the microwave spectrum instead of laser light. And this is actually closer to the original idea proposed by Tsiolkovsky. We'll get into microwave propulsion a bit later, so don't worry about differences in the methods for now. They represent very similar economic challenges. Parkin Research claims switching to their beamed microwave thermal rockets would save $100 million a week on launch costs for NASA. Of course, the main factor influencing adoption of these proposals into real-world studies is whether this method is cheaper than traditional rockets offered by commercial providers like SpaceX or United Launch Alliance. So clearly, laser propulsion is appealing. Foremost, it is a solution entirely based in known physics, which has been proven viable in real-world missions and also laboratory tests. Secondly, it is predicated on conventional, commercially available technology. Types of laser propulsion can be classified generally as laser light sails, where photons are used to push a thin sail, ablative laser propulsion, where lasers are used to turn a solid propellant into a plasma which imparts momentum on the vehicle, and beam-powered propulsion, where lasers or another type of electromagnetic radiation delivers momentum or thermal energy to a fuel mass carried by the vehicle. Some designs in the beam-powered category still use a more traditional rocket nozzle, a nuclear thermal engine, or may convert thermal energy into electricity to operate ion thrusters. Jordan Kerr, aerospace engineer, may have been the first to seriously consider using a laser to heat up a non-ablating propellant in a paper published in 1992. He described the system as a laser-driven heat exchanger, and this would heat up liquid hydrogen, which in the process of phase change would impart thrust in a rocket nozzle. It's pretty obvious, though, that using laser energy to heat up a propellant is going to generate small amounts of thrust. If we want to increase this, the obvious option is to use the laser energy to catalyze and sustain a nuclear fission reaction. This is another good option, but it does add complexity. We're more likely to see a laser-driven thermal engine before a laser nuclear thermal engine, since they represent a linear progression of the same concepts. The journal Acta Astronautica published a paper in 2022 outlining a Mars mission using a laser-driven exchanger, touting an engine that has a, quote, combination of high thrust and high specific impulse, making this approach favorable in comparison to laser electric propulsion and occupying a parameter space similar to gas core nuclear thermal rockets without the requisite reactor, end quote. The paper acknowledges the only barrier to realizing this mission would be the unprecedented nature of the laser array needed, a 10-meter diameter aperture 100-megawatt laser, Considering Tsiolkovsky's 1924 proposal demanded a 12-kilometer aperture, we can see how dramatically technology has progressed over a century. Even if we don't use microwaves or lasers to power a launch vehicle, we could still use terrestrial arrays to power various engines in orbit and beyond. Having the option to use space-based or terrestrial lasers is a big deal for safety and preserving low cost. The notion of powering an ion engine using beamed energy has been proven in atmospheric power transmission tests, where interference sources are more numerous than in space. Researchers, too, have begun to realize that these power transmission tests prove the beamed energy concept in really all of its iterations hence why these concepts have received so much attention as of late. The historic concerns around laser efficiency, nuclear development, and material limits, such as those faced by Tsiolkovsky and even the Falcon Project, are all but resolved today. There are numerous ways to enhance the three types of laser propulsion we've discussed. The laser light sail can be fabricated with a layer of nuclear material on its surface, allowing laser energy to directly initiate fission or fusion, increasing force on the sail. 
This nuclear-assisted sail is a kind of middle ground between solar sails and ablative propulsion, with better thrust than either. Another method considered highly viable by researchers today involves a concept known as photon recycling. Simply, this approach involves bouncing light between the vehicle and a mirror placed a distance away, which accelerates away as it re-reflects light to increase thrust. This allows photons to exert momentum on the sail multiple times, increasing thrust without increasing power consumption. If desired, this mirror can be built onto a spacecraft also carrying the laser array, making this approach very easy to deploy in a single launch. If we focus the laser beam on an optical resonance cavity, much like is used by a laser, we can increase thrust output exponentially. This essentially creates a double-ended laser, where laser energy is emitted from both ends, even though only one end is pumping the laser. This approach does have unresolved engineering challenges, and is probably only viable if we use spaceborne laser arrays, since they do not contend with atmospheric effects. When discussing larger scale systems, the allure of replacing lasers with phased microwave emitters is evident. Microwaves require larger apertures because they consist of longer wavelengths. Microwaves are less energy efficient than lasers, yet in our modern energy economy, microwaves are between 1 to 4 orders of magnitude cheaper per watt. Microwaves also circumvent atmospheric effects. When Tsiolkovsky proposed his original light sails, he understood that diffraction meant his microwave sources would need an aperture in excess of a kilometer. Today, advances in technology have reduced this limit to around 100 meters. In comparison, lasers with a similar performance have apertures of around 1 meter. Further, microwaves need to be in phase to function, increasing complexity and cost of the arrays. So, laser arrays tend to be compact, cheaper to build, and more expensive to operate, while microwave arrays are larger, expensive to build, and cheap to operate. We can envision a propulsion system which can use both microwave and laser energy depending which array is available. Lasers can be normally used, but in case of bad weather or cloud cover, microwaves are used instead without changing vehicles. A combination of laser and microwave beamed energy can be used at our current technology readiness levels to propel vehicles throughout the solar system and beyond. Thanks for tuning in guys, I hope you enjoyed today's content. If you did enjoy, leave a like and go ahead and leave a comment too, that really helps the channel. And subscribe for more videos like this. Thank you.